Hi, I'm Cal Lane, Associate Rector of St. George's Episcopal Church here in Dayton, Ohio, and I'm very happy to bring to you a Sunday Bible study. This Bible study tracks along with what we would be doing in our youth Bible studies, but I assure you, if you are an adult, this will be a blessing for you. So this short Bible study, we are going to be turning to the first book of Kings, uh, chapters 16 through 19. And while I'm not going to read all those chapters to you, I encourage you to pause at various points, or you can pause right now and read those chapters, 1 Kings 16 through 19. As I always remind folks, whatever version of the Bible, whatever, properly speaking, uh, translation you have of the Bible will be perfectly fine. Again, we think that the King James Version is probably best for weddings and funerals, and the message is probably best for, um, you know, private devotion, but whatever uh, contemporary translation you have will be fine. We usually go with the ESV, the English Standard Version. So again, if you'll turn to 1 Kings uh, chapter 16 through 19 uh, now. We're going to be hearing stories uh, today about Elijah. Elijah, who is one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. Now, just for a little context, we've seen the division of God's people into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. This is after the rule of Solomon, the northern kingdom of Israel, which has more people, and the southern kingdom of Judah, which has uh, fewer people, but it has the city of Jerusalem, and therefore it has the temple, and it also has the Davidic line of kings. We'll remember that the northern kingdom will be destroyed by the Assyrians in the 700s, and the southern kingdom will be uh, exiled into Babylon by the Babylonians in the 500s. So this is before those two destructions happen, but after the division uh, of, of, the, uh, of the kingdoms. So we're uh, going to be meeting Elijah. Elijah. And Elijah will have the prophetic ministry of calling King Ahab to account for his infidelities to God's covenant. And just like Solomon, we see that this is this is often happening, this, um, this veering away from God's covenants, right? From God's command to worship him only. It often has its source and root in these uh, foreign alliances, most particularly these foreign marriages uh, that um, King Ahab, just like Solomon had done, that King Ahab will enter into. Uh, most notably, his marriage with Jezebel. This name Jezebel, it even in our contemporary Western scene, has sort of a, a grimace-inducing ring to it. Jezebel. Jezebel who sways Ahab to worship the Baals, these foreign gods, these gods that require really abominable forms of worship, like we talked about the worship of Moloch last week. Um, requiring child sacrifice, and it's 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 distasteful to God. So he sends a series of prophets through the the balance of the Old Testament to warn his people, and so we're 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 encountering the prophet Elijah uh, in these stories again in First Kings sixteen through nineteen. So what are some of the things that Elijah, pardon me, that 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 Ahab does that are that are so distasteful. Again, he marries this this foreign uh, queen Jezebel. He worships uh, Baal or the Baals, as they're sometimes called. Sometimes it's it's pluralized. Uh, likewise, he rebuilds the city of Jericho, Jericho, uh, which had been destroyed by Joshua much earlier uh, in the story of the Old Testament, and there was actually a curse on anyone who would rebuild Jericho. Um, so Ahab. Uh, is sacrificing to foreign gods. He's rebuilding Jericho. Um, he's doing all these really, these really rotten, terrible things. So Elijah shows up on the scene, and there's a lot of stories you can read in 16 and 17, but I want to just fast forward now to chapter 18, where Elijah has this showdown with the prophets of Baal. So if you'll look at uh, 1 Kings um, uh, chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, if you'll turn to uh, verse uh, 20, verse 20, 1 Kings 18, verse 20. Again, at any point, you're welcome to pause and read all four of those chapters. But if we just zero in on 1 Kings 18, verse 20, we see, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel 
and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. So just, just calling the question to the people. He's gathered them together and he's calling the question. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So it's Elijah versus 450 prophets of Baal. And then Elijah says this, this is verse 23. Let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. So basically, Elijah is going to have a showdown. He says, get two bulls. We're going to sacrifice it, cut it up, put it on the wood, but not light it yet. Right? You call up, this is verse 24, you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So basically, whichever of these two sacrifices bursts into flames, it'll be a sign of the truth, right? And the authority and power and sovereignty of either Baal or the Lord, right? All the people say it's well spoken. So they, they go through with this, and... Um, the prophets of Baal, this is in verse 26, you know, they're crying out and crying out and crying out. And nothing's happening. Then if you look at uh, 27, this is this is where there's, there's, there's humor in the Bible. In verse 27, at noon, Elijah mocked them saying, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself. He's in the bathroom uh, or he is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Um, so he's sort of making fun of them. And then they, they go to, they, they start cutting themselves. I mean, these sort of gruesome practices get to get the attention of Baal and nothing happens. Well, as the story unfolds, then Elijah takes his turn, but to make the point, uh, he actually drenches the sacrifice in water. He digs a trench around the sacrifice and fills it with water really to make a show. I mean, this is theatrical. He's drenching the sacrifice with water. Um, and this is, this is in verse 36, Elijah, the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you've turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So everyone then falls on their faces and recognizes the truth of the Lord. And as the story goes on, um, all of these prophets, these 450 prophets that were sort of shown up, they all then are executed. So, I mean, this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a hard lesson learned. Well, this is theatrical. It's the stuff of movies, to be sure. But there's a follow-up story. There's a follow-up story that I really want you to notice. And that is that it doesn't convince Ahab and Jezebel at least not effectively so. And Elijah is on the run again. So as chapter 19 opens up, um, they want to hunt down Elijah. So the lesson here is, or one lesson to be drawn here, is that sometimes even the great big theatrics don't really produce faith. That faith in God is a gift. Um, and even with these theatrics, some are still not convinced. So if you look at chapter 19, uh, verse 9, Elijah is in hiding now. He's in hiding now. He came to a cave, he lodged there, and the voice of the Lord comes to him and says, you know, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is in verse 9. Verse 10, he says, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. This is in um, 1911. Uh, and he, meaning God, he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And then three interesting things happen. Um, the Lord passes by and there's a great and strong wind which tore the mountains. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. This is still verse 11. 
1911. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, so he wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a great fire in verse 12. The Lord was not in the fire. So you've got wind, earthquake, fire, these great theatrics. God isn't in it. And then a low whisper. This is how my translation reads. Sometimes the translations are a still small voice. A still small voice. Verse 13. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Again, this sort of interchange. He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life. So the Lord says, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Uh, Syria, pardon me. Um, so what I want to notice, just to, to wrap up here, is again, we see the, the theatrics, but God isn't in the theatrics. God isn't in the, the wind or the fire or the earthquake. He's in the still, small voice. The still, small voice. The voice that is often unexpected. Now, the very last thing I want to say in this Bible study is this. We're often tempted when we hear this, everything I've just laid out, to think, ah, that's the voice of our conscience. The voice that's inside of us. Isn't that the lesson that we often hear from movies? Just listen to your heart. Just listen to yourself. The, the, the truth that's within yourself. I don't think that's the actual bi biblical message here. The voice is still external. The voice is external to Elijah. So in discernment, what a lot of people in our culture are tempted to do is listen to what's inside them. But that's actually not a biblical message. C.S. Lewis put it rather brilliantly at the end of Mere Christianity, one of his books, when he said that if we look only inside of ourselves, what we will find is selfishness. What we'll find in the, in the end is corruption. We are, in Luther's words, turned in on ourselves. But if we look outside of ourselves, then we can find God. So, uh, indeed, the way to go about discernment, listening for God, is often very simple. It's being in relationship with others in the life of the church, reading scripture diligently, coming often to prayer, um, and relying on the, um, the spirit that God promises will be in these places, right? So again, uh, he wasn't in the great theatrics. He was in the still small voice, that voice that we can attend to even to this day in the life of the church, in prayer, and of course, in in diligently reading his word. So I'm glad that you've tuned in for this Bible study. Please do check out our other videos here on uh, this YouTube channel. And may God's peace be with you this day and always.